<sighs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Tiernan. I hope you are doing well. January is over, which is weird, but it also lasted forever. Not quite as long as last March, but I feel like we've been here for a minute in this new year. Uh, I read 15 books in January. Like, actually. Huh. That is a record for me, and I'm really excited about it. There are some graphic novels and poetry books in here, which obviously count, but I also was constantly reading novels and a couple memoirs are in here, so I've got a good list. And an interesting thing that happened for me in January was I reread three favorite books of mine, which is a thing that people do all the time, but not me. I, just, I am not a rereader at all. And so the fact that I reread three books tells me that well, something's going on. I don't want to face the present or the future. Or, more simply, I wanted to revisit some stories that I love. <sighs> I think it's both. So I've made a couple videos where I paint my nails this silver glitter and talk about the books I've read in the month. I find it to be a really relaxing way to process my thoughts and you guys seem to also appreciate it. The first books that I want to talk about are the first three books in the Heartstopper series by Alice Oseman. This is a graphic novel series. The fourth book is coming out soon this year. But oh my god. Ugh. If I had these graphic novels in high school, I would have read graphic novels in high school. Heartstopper follows a gay couple, Nick and Charlie. Charlie is the main character and he has been out for a while as gay. He becomes good friends with Nick who invites him to join the rugby team and Nick develops a little crush and realizes he's bisexual. And so the first three books follow their relationship and coming out for Nick and their friend groups. And it's just like mostly good stuff though. It's, you know, there's not any dire conflict, which I think for some people is a bit of a turnoff. But I mean, just to read this adorable, well done gay romance is such a treat. And there is plenty of conflict that arises, but it really is like their love story at the center. And Alice Oseman, you can feel, just wants it to be a positive, happy reading experience. Like so many heart fluttering moments. It's just, it's just ridiculously cute. I think I really loved the second one the most, but I love them. I could see myself rereading them because that's the thing I do now. Now I'm highly tempted to read an Alice Oseman novel. I know my friend Jenna is obsessed with Loveless, so I'd love to get my hands on that. But for now, in January, I just had a great time. These were my weekend reads, like on Saturdays, I would wake up and just devour one of these graphic novels and it was so awesome. And the other graphic novel I read in January kind of very similar, but I don't have it with me, is Check, Please, Volume 1 by Ngozi Kazu. This follows a college hockey vlogger boy who falls in love with another boy on his team and is also a super cute love story, but is more, like, main character driven as opposed to this one where, like, they're obviously the main couple. I have Volume 2 on my shelf now and I plan to read that probably in February, but definitely soon. Between the two, like, no need to compare, but they are kind of similar, so I would say Heartstopper grabbed me more just because I liked uh, the style of it, I think, a little bit more and kind of just the shameless love story. I didn't feel like I was um, powering through a reading experience. Like, Heartstopper really just took me by the heart and ran. But Check, Please was so, so lovely as well. I highly recommend it. The book that I was most excited to read in January that I did was What Belongs to You by Garth Greenwell. This is Garth Greenwell's debut novel. His second novel that came out in 2020 was my favorite book of 2020, and I read it in October. So I knew I needed to give myself a little bit of space before I read his previous book, and I thought three months was plenty and I wanted to escape back into his writing style. A few friends have read Cleanness because of me and it makes me really happy. So I read What Belongs to You and was immediately swept back into Garth Greenwell's gorgeous writing, just absolutely breathtaking, unique. I've never read anything like his books. When I read Cleanness, uh, it was very much a relaxing experience to read that book. Cleanness is split up into nine sections, and so I read it over nine days. 
What belongs to you is split up into three sections, and so they're much longer. And I think the structure of cleanness fits Garth Greenwell's writing much better than the structure of this first book. There was kind of a heaviness to What Belongs to You. What Belongs to You feels like a necessary step to get to cleanness, and I wish I had read them in the reverse order of what I did so I could experience that journey rather than, you know, see what came first. So I could have appreciated What Belongs to You a little bit more probably when I didn't know how he could take it from a 9 to a 10. So I think I did myself a disservice there. But I still thoroughly enjoyed the experience of reading What Belongs to You. It was just a little bit more exhausting. There was just this dourness in the writing and the main relationship that it follows was stressful, like more so than anything else. Like it was stressful in a good book situation, but then it was just like stressful to revisit. Highly recommend both of them. If you're really intrigued, I would read What Belongs to You and then Cleanness, but still wholeheartedly recommend reading Cleanness one chapter a night for nine nights. You'll thank me later. Top-notch queer storytelling. And speaking of queer storytelling, well, <laughs> I'm looking over my stack of what to take next and it's all, it's all that. But I think I want to talk about Alex Dimitrov's Love and Other Poems, which is actually the very first book I read in January on New Year's Day. And I'm so glad I started my year with this gorgeous book of poems. This book comes out actually February 9th. I follow Alex Dimitrov on Twitter because he runs with his friend this account called poet astrologers. Every week on Sunday night they post a poem about every sign and what their week will be like and they're all really good and I'm always looking for them on Sunday nights and reading the Gemini ones and also the Pisces for my moon and the Sagittarius for my rising. So I'm already a fan of his work and I definitely saw traces of those weekly poems in his work here. There's this one poem called Poem Written in a Cab or something like that and it's kind of a longer one, and it's actually what closes the book, and he wrote the entire thing in caps in New York over a period of time. Time is also a big element in this collection. That It follows, there's a poem for every month, and it follows a year, but not in the calendar order. Just really beautiful stuff. Life and love and being in love and New York, and I really want to read this again. And speaking of, one of the books I reread this month was Red, White, and Royal Blue by Casey McQuiston. This was such a pleasure to reread. I first read it in summer of 2019 after it came out, and last fall I read their second book, One Last Stop, which comes out in May or June. So it was fascinating after reading One Last Stop to come back to Red, White, and Royal Blue and see how their writing evolved. Honestly, they're so separate and they're both top tier. Like, there's nothing deficient about Red, White, and Royal Blue that is like made up for in their second book, so you really do get to kind of look at them as two separate masterpieces, which is just lovely. Second read of Red, White, and Royal Blue is even better than the first one, in case you haven't done that yet. It's so nice to read a rom-com or a romance over again when you know what happens because you really get to appreciate watching the author plant seeds and build a character and it's the mastery of building a romance. Like when it's that compelling again, when you already know what happens, that's really a testament to the writing. And with the context of their second book, just a little bit, like I wasn't comparing them, but this one has a coming out narrative and they're dealing with fame and politics. And so Casey McQuiston's second book, One Last Stop, follows queer people trying to pay rent in New York City in their 20s. And that's more enjoyable and relatable to me. I guess I would just take this opportunity to say read Red, White, and Royal Blue and read One Last Stop. The next book I read is Juliet Takes a Breath by Gabby Rivera. Cute story, my mom actually bought me this book for Christmas after listening to Gabby Rivera on the Brene Brown podcast. What a mom thing to say. <laughs> but I'm so glad because the book was so lovely and I thoroughly enjoyed. When I first was seeing this book last year at Barnes & Noble, I thought Juliet Takes a Breath meant this main character was stepping back and like kind of taking some time for herself. I was pleasantly surprised, I mean I would have enjoyed that, but I was pleasantly surprised to learn what it actually meant because it was different. That taking a breath actually means like taking up space, or at least that's kind of how I interpret the themes of this story. The main character of this book is a self-proclaimed closeted Puerto Rican baby dyke from the Bronx. That's a very good <laughs> description. So Julia is obsessed with this kind of Glennon Doyle type white lady feminist 
spiritual, inspirational author, no tea, no shade. So after sending a super gushy, kind email to this author, she gets invited to come be her intern in Portland, Oregon for a summer and basically adventure ensues and a lot of crazy stuff goes down. It's interesting to read about these heavy themes that you kind of read about in, you know, queer theory, feminist theory, to read about them from a YA voice, someone who's learning it. I thought that was very well done. You kind of get to ask questions through the narrator who's learning as she goes because she's very young and it's just so lovely. Lots of learning and then it, when it takes a turn is also. The next book I read and want to talk about is The Velvet Rage by Alan Downs, PhD. This book has been on my radar forever. It's about overcoming the shame of growing up gay in a straight man's world. It's a book all about gay men, basically. So I've been meaning to read it for a really long time. It's, you know, about gay shame. It's originally from 2005, and then this second edition came out in 2012 with some updates. It's interesting knowing this is from 2005 um, because I feel like so many of the ideas that are presented in here, they would have blown my mind five years ago. And I feel like this book has come into our queer lives and spaces so much that I've, I had already learned a lot of what is in here. And that's not to say I didn't learn and absorb in a new way. It was much less mind blowing than I thought because we talk about shame now and we talk about um, toxicity in gay culture. That is true more so now than ever. We still have a long way to go. I think, you know, as a Gen Zer, there's a lot of work to be done. There's grinder culture. Oh God, imagine if Alan Downs had to write about grinder now. Maybe he is. It was enjoyable and, you know, eye opening in some regards. The ending sections talk about like ways to actually deal with our instinct to overcompensate for shame. And I thought those like on the ground skills that he presents were the most helpful to me. Because again, I think it's actually a testament to how on point this book is that I, a 22 year old, read this in 2021 and felt like I kind of already got it. Like we, I've, I've had a lot of these conversations with people already. And I think it's because it has trickled down through things like this book. If I had read it before college, I think, before I was around other queer people and talking about what it means to be queer and talking about shame and, you know, doing work on it myself already, then I think this book would have blown my mind. The next book I want to talk about is Eileen by Otessa Moshveg. This was such a doozy. Oh my god. Eileen is like a total literary fiction character study. I read Otessa Moshveg's book that came after this, My Year of Rest and Relaxation, in 2019 and loved it so much. And I think I loved it, well, because it's very well written and I appreciated the themes. I was just in a weirder place in my life, believe it or not, you know, being in that post-grad summer. So Eileen, I struggled with till the end. And I think it's definitely worth sticking around till the end. And I definitely still read it uh, fairly quickly. Eileen is an incredibly compelling and interesting character. And there's just this really beautifully grotesqueness to the narration. I'm saying all good things, but I did struggle with it. I struggled with the pacing, kind of just the storytelling in general. I highly recommend Otessa Moshveg's other book, My Year of Rest and Relaxation. And I do have her newest book, Death in Her Hands, which came out last year. Still a huge fan, but I did struggle with Eileen. Another book I re-read in January was The Great Gatsby <laughs> by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This was a book I read in high school. I was in the play in high school. The Baz Luhrmann movie came out when I was in high school, so I had a very strong tie to this story, and then I peacefully let it go for a long time. And just recently I've been thinking about kind of that time in my life and thought The Great Gatsby would be a portal back into it, and it certainly was. So many lines and character moments and pieces of dialogue stood out to me. It's a very pithy book, you know, like, what's there is there. It's all the story. It's all necessary. And I actually listened to the audiobook, which is narrated by Jake Gyllenhaal. It was a pretty fun experience to do that. I couldn't find my physical copy, which I know I owned, like, three, but it was fun to reread. I highly recommend rereading those, like, high school classics. Imagine, okay, I think I might reread The Fault in Our Stars soon. Next book I read in January was Kink, an anthology collection of short stories, literary fiction dealing with kink. I struggled with kink a lot. 
and don't get me wrong, I was ready for some sexy times in this book. I was even ready for some deep, you know, thinking about kink and how it's perceived and what it means. Like, I was pretty on board going into it and was let down. I think, to be fair, I don't like anthologies. Some of the stories are way longer than other ones. You like some and you don't like some. This book, to me, was just really off balance. I read it in galley form and it comes out February 9th. There are some gems in here, but I was excited about Roxanne Gay, about Garth Greenwell, author of Cleanness. I was excited about Alexander Chi, but my favorites were not even them. I, I remember really liking the first story. I was talking earlier about how much I love Garth Greenwell's two books. I spent a lot of kink looking forward to Garth Greenwell's story, only to arrive at it and realize it's a chapter from Cleanness. Chapter two of Cleanness is his selection in kink. I don't know how I could have known that. I don't know if that information is out there and I missed it, but when I thought I was reading something new from Garth Greenwell and it was something from Cleanness, it hurts. I also think I did myself a disservice by reading Kink right after I read What Belongs to You by Garth Greenwell because What Belongs to You is way more sexual and explicit and even kinky than this anthology. The next book I want to talk about is Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. My mom read this book in December and really wanted me to read it as a writer and I'm so glad I did and we had a little book club moment about it too. So Elizabeth Gilbert, if you don't know, is the author of Eat, Pray, Love. In my mind, I thought she had been like a lawyer or something before Eat, Pray, Love, but no, she's like a hardcore novelist, was like bartending before she wrote novels. She is a writer and she has some really sound advice for writers. It's really about taking your creative life and making it happen for yourself, not necessarily needing to do anything crazy about it. She talks about how like you don't have to quit your day job in order to be an artist. You don't have to give up your entire life to go, you know, to Paris and write your novel. You can incorporate creativity into everything you do and beyond. What I took from it was a lot of like, you know, trusting your instincts. She talks about inspiration a lot. There's this really fun story about how she had an idea for a novel that she ended up having to let go of. And then her friend Ann Patchett, the novelist, had that exact same idea. The way they find out about it from each other is really funny and totally believable. Like I was, I really buy into how she sees creativity and storytelling. It's a great audiobook too. It's a good, you know, listen for creative people, but it's also one that I want to go back and highlight things in. And the final book I want to talk about is another reread and it is History's All You Left Me by Adam Silvera. This is the arc that I read back in 2016 before it came out in 2017. I only know this because I ended up moderating a panel for him on his tour that January. Yes, I see, because I was moving back into college. This is my favorite Adam Silvera book, and I'm so glad I reread it. It's exactly how I remembered, actually, which was a nice surprise. Like, I remembered so much about this. It really impacted me. It is a true, sad, somber, queer story, but with really great reason. Adam Silvera is just the real deal, and this book, for me, is, was what solidified that. I think this is some of his best writing, just very atmospheric. The structure of going back and forth from first to second person and back. The history chapters are the love story between Griffin and Theo, and then the today chapters are Griffin talking to Theo, who has passed away. Griffin's also dealing with the fact that Theo had started seeing someone else, and so he develops a friendship with Theo's new boyfriend. And so there's a lot of pain there. There's a lot of discovery. Felt like I was reading it for the first time, but I also felt like I was reading an old classic, a favorite. So this was a good call for me, I will say. I ended my month on the right note. Oh, I totally lied. That is not... I read another book this month. I didn't bring it down here, but I do have it. Just imagine it, or the, look at the picture. It's Over the Top by Jonathan Van Ness. How could I forget? So Jonathan Van Ness is obviously from Queer Eye. I decided to read his book because he narrates the audiobook. I knew that he had a really powerful story. I did not realize quite how dark and sad and raw this memoir would be, but I really encourage everyone to read this book. His story took my breath away. Literally up until he was on Queer Eye, it was rough going. He's just such an inspiration for overcoming and living authentically. His hometown is not too far from mine in Illinois, so I related to a lot of what he said. He inspired me so much and it made me want to go watch Queer Eye more. If you know 
queer eye and you know him, you're going to want to read this book. It's been out for a minute now. So those are all the books I read in January. Thank you so much for watching. I would love it if you left me a comment and told me your favorite book from this past month. My name is Tiernan. Thank you so much for watching. I will have another video very soon. Have a good one. Thank you so much and